breakthrough, um, an invention. This meeting is <clears> being <throat> recorded. So going from here to where? We start with a technology. and we talk about technology to practice or adoption over on the right-hand side, we have the technology. That's where you're starting. You need to figure out how to measure the business, how to govern the business, how to manage the business, what the structures are, how to explain it to other people that you're selling to, how to mature the company. You need to understand your situation and you need to get from that understanding to the improvements that you need to make in order to make it successful. And that means you need a process like plan, do, check, act, which is the you know security process from ISO uh, 2700 and so forth. And uh, it takes time, money, experts, uh, team, and luck. And there's a lot of stuff to do to get to success. So I'm just going to tell you, you know, angel to exit, a2e.co is the, the website. We have lots of free material. You can join our mailing list. You can get um, free articles and free videos. And we help grow companies. And that is, you know, we can help grow yours. Um, you can attend our monthly call. It doesn't cost anything. We can discuss a path forward, but only if you're really serious about it. The only thing any of us really have is time. And we don't really, you know, have so much of it, right? We don't have that much. We don't know how much we have. So I don't want to waste your time and I don't want you to waste mine. If you have somewhere you want to go with this and you want help getting there, we're happy to do that. So, but you have to be serious. You have to recognize what you really want in this process. And based on that, we can talk about how we can help you succeed. So that's, that's the end of my, um, and we'll call it a pitch, but I'm, it's not really a pitch because you know, when you come to the meetings, that's when you get the real pitch. Any questions, comments, or discussion? Don't, okay. don't bother to raise your hand, just talk. <laughs> okay, good. I'm just trying to be polite. Um, so first of all, I hope you feel better soon. Watch out for the boomerang on Paxlovid. It, it'll come back. Yep. And anyway, but it should help in the meantime. So um, what are the demographics of who you attract? Not, you know, human wise, but just, you know, company wise or their role, you know, when women versus men versus other genders would be interesting, but that's not what I was asking. So do you attract people that are, you know, professors looking for tenure who've done some research and have some students, or do you attract people that know they want to be entrepreneurs or, you know, what, what's the split? So who are you attracting who have been successful? However, you define success just to get a feel for, you know, how that's helping. And if yeah. this is a model, we should think of growing. So just to answer your first question about women versus men, um, you know, those free articles, one of those articles is about um, uh, it's, uh, sex and the startup or something like that. And it talks about the numbers. So it has, has the numbers of you know, how many people apply and, and how many people move through whatever part of the process that we have. And it also refers to Keiritsu Farm where I, I used to be the founding chapter president of the Pebble Beach chapter. I guess I am forever the founding chapter president. <laughs> um, but um, so it, it turns out in many cases, we don't know if they're male or female um, because our process is largely online mm -hmm. and we don't have it as a question. We're, you know, frankly, I don't care and I'm not interested. Um, statistics, show historically that women that get to the point where they're starting businesses are more successful. That is more of them succeed, more of those businesses succeed than those of men. But the reason for that is something we don't really know. I don't, I don't have the basis for it. My belief is that it's a tougher road. And so women who decide to do this are more serious about it. And, and they're, you know, they're going to succeed no matter what. And so that gives them, you know, uh, an advantage over men who sometimes are just, um, I won't say the actual words, but you can imagine the words I might use with regard to some of them. Um, <clears throat> so we have a transparency program and we publish um, in our quarterly update um, statistics on how many companies come, how many succeed and so forth. We get about 100 companies per year where 
technically the sixth largest accelerator slash incubator in the uh, Bay Area region of California. And uh, so I think uh, I was just looking today, uh, it's now our third year in a row of being this <clears throat> sixth position. Um, so uh, Y Combinator, I think, is, is two above us, <laughs> you know, these huge billion dollar entities, which we are not. The, um, so the companies that you deal with have to do with your restrictions on them more than their restrictions on you. And the way you get companies to come through these processes is you go out and find them. So, you know, you go to Crunchbase or whatever and you, you know, get the list of things and you elicit them and try to convince them that they're interested, bring them into the process and then go through the process with them. We have about 15,000 companies who are, we'll call them members, they're on our mailing list. Um, they communicate with us from time to time, <clears throat> about 100 per year process through the acceleration or incubator process to one extent or another. Um, we don't do real estate. We'll do real estate tech, but not real estate. We won't do outer space. It just takes too much funding uh, for the level at which we operate. And we won't do anything we consider to be bad. Um, generally speaking, doing well by doing good is our approach to the world. So we are, we're only interested, you know, by the way, if you have a new drug that's still legal to replace tobacco, you can probably make billions on it. And, and I don't actually wish you the best of success, but we're not interested. So we, um, that, I think that answers all of your questions. If I miss some, just ask them again. Yeah, and so what percentage of those would be like, you know, researchers, you know, or what percent oh, of yeah. those would be TTP or SBIR? So, because we're kind of coming from this NSF, TTP, SBIR, STTR yeah. world. So is it a different planet? Is like one out of a hundred one of them or none out of a hundred? So we, we, we're actually building a program right now, which is CEOs for startups. And, and we have funders that want to take, um, create companies from technologies out of the national labs and out of universities. And that's one of the reasons I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, historically, I, I, don't, I don't have exact numbers, but certainly more than 10% are people from academia. Um, and, and still in academia. And so that's, you know, maybe one a month or something like that. Um, but the other side of it is, um, you know, remember we talked about financial engineering. So when you look at companies, you know, we want them to get grants if those are right things for them to do. So several of our companies are in the SBIR process. Several of them are funded by SBIRs. Mm -hmm. You know, they're in phase two in many cases. We want them to get to phase three because there's procurement opportunities. And uh, so, so we drive them into those pipelines, right? As appropriate to the financial engineering of the company. And, and we think that that's a good path forward for a startup. Having said that, <clears throat> that, you know, when you talk about NSF versus DARPA versus ONR versus versus versus, mm -hmm. NSF is generally the least money for the most effort, the harshest, we'll call it evaluation process and the least supportive of the corporate side because historically they're about building science. Whereas DARPA is about avoiding strategic surprise, right? And so they're, they're trying to find out about new technologies so they're not surprised. And, and ONR is about things that help the Navy succeed, right? And, and Department of Energy is about, among other things, you know, training and education um, so that people can implement new, more energy efficient homes, right? And, and so what you do is you find the niche for the company and then you go out and find funding sources that meet that niche and you engineer the finances so that they need the minimum of outside equity investment. So you help them find private equity as well as help them learn more about federal agency funding vehicles they may be able to take advantage of. Well, so you, you saw that stack of different sources, right? Right. So private equity as a term of art is usually, you know, hundred million billion dollar private equity, right? So they don't put in less than 50 million. And, you know, cause they, if they're investing a billion a year, if you put in 50 million, that means you need twice a month 
to go through a complete diligence and pick one that you're going to buy into. It's just too, too hard to get through it. Um, <clears throat> so family offices is another niche that works well once you're operating in the multi-million dollar uh, revenue level. They're trying to go wealth preservations. You have corporate venture capital, which has different orientations. They're looking at strategic advantage for their corporations. Venture capital, which as I generally view as pretty exploitive. They want to get you from five to $50 million. And, and everybody claims to come down into the death valley of fundraising between about you know 750K and 2 million, but they don't. Angel groups occasionally will get up into the bottom part of it. You can now do crowdfunding in that space. That's a place where SBIRs work really well and STTRs. So because you can get phase one, it's only 250K or something like that for six to nine months, but phase two, you can get a million and a half. And so, so the phase two SBIRs are the place you can fill that gap uh, realistically. And then the other aspects of that are that it, when you're doing that process, once you get into that process, it becomes a machine. It's just like any other sales sieve. So if you can get one in 10 of your applications funded in phase one and say 50% move on to phase two, then you know what it costs you, how much time it takes, and you just create a machine that submits application after application after application, and you build it up over a period of say five years to five to $10 million a year of funding, which is enough to do all the R&D and the overhead on that's about, or sorry, the, the, what they call fee, which is profit is about 8%. So uh, that's 80,000 per million. So that's, you know, uh, 400,000 for 5 million in funding. So that 400,000 is enough for a reasonable go to market plan. And you can start to sell and sell and sell. The other thing is, after you get through phase two, you can get into procurement and, and you have all these advantages of being in a so called phase three um, uh, SBIR, uh, that is the non compete and, and so forth. So, so it's very handy to go into the federal government. And then you can build up to hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of, of success for your company. So that's, that's a very strong path for companies that have those things. So the other thing about that is um, we tell companies, you don't go after that funding because you need the cash. Yes, you need the cash, and that's part of the reason. The reason you go after that funding is because it has strategic value to the company. Otherwise, you're just distracting yourself from what you're trying to do. So the, the point of the SBIR funding um, and, and the other similar kinds of funding is that your company needs to continue to develop this technology in order to be successful. And there's some link between what the funding agency wants and what you're going to do. And it doesn't have to be that you're doing exactly what they want, right? So suppose I'm in a material science company and I can apply material science to shoelaces. And the government says, well, we need better shoelaces for the boots for our soldiers. Okay, I can apply and do the material science associated with that. That same thing might be used for the fabric that goes into clothing, which might be my business model. But you have to find that alignment you know, just a, what is it? It's a research market fit. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much, Fred. Fred, just to comment, I mean, thank you very much. I appreciated how that was all laid out. And um, it was good to see it put it all, all in one place. So just thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. You know, the uh, you go to all.net and you can click on the, the first link on the main part of the page and have a copy of the presentation. I know I went through it very, very quickly. If, um, if, if, if you would, for, for me, Fred, who is I'm, I'm big on definitions and I'm not certain I have this square in my mind. You, you call A2E a, a uh, accelerator incubator, and I'm familiar with both of those terms and how they fit in this environment. Uh, what what parts of your of A two E do you consider to be accelerator parts, and what part are incubator parts, and are there parts of what you do that don't fit into either one of those two categories? Yeah, yeah. So I don't I don't call it an accelerator incubator. Um, the uh, the San Francisco Business Times has a category called accelerator incubators. Okay. 
And, and so that's the category we fit in. <clears throat> so generally speaking, the definitions are not well-defined. And in fact, one of the problems in, in most of the business space is the definitions are not well-defined. <laughs> so, you know, who knows? Generally speaking, an incubator will be a place where you're physically present. An accelerator is some, I'll call it a process to help get things to run faster. So we used to have an incubator in, um, it was in Pacific Grove, which is right next to Pebble Beach where I live in Monterey uh, County, California, along the ocean. <clears throat> so people would physically come there and collaborate together. Um, we ended that before the pandemic. We've always been live online remote for everything we've done and from long before the pandemic. So, you know, our goal is acceleration. So we provide tools and techniques and expertise and sort of fill the gaps. So whatever you don't have, we bring to the table. Now we're not going to replace your, you know, head of marketing. What we're going to do is help you develop the marketing plan. And maybe we can help you find an executive that's suitable to that. But, you know, remember we have, you know, a dozen or so companies that we're working with at any given time, at least. Um, in a long-term multi-year relationship to help grow their companies. So obviously I can't spend, you know, the, the 60 to 80 hours a week as a chief marketing officer for any of those companies, nor can any of our advisors that work on those things. So when you get to the point where somebody who's advising you becomes somebody you want to engage more, you know, heavily or full-time, you hire them. They're no longer an advisor. When you, you know, the acceleration includes tools. <clears throat> so the tools that we provide, um, they're tools that you can use to help run your business, but also to present it to potential investors. So you use those tools over a long period of time. We also have other things though. I have a radio show every Wednesday. It's called the Cyber Show. I mean, it's not just cybersecurity, it's all things cyber. We have interviews, you know, with like Peter Neumann who runs the risk forum. Yeah, that's in a sequence right now. So it's a radio show and companies that are in our ecosystem, they get to present on the radio show. So we'll have a sequence of interviews with them about their company and that helps get them um, better public relations, right? It, it's a, a publicity method for them. It also can help them generate sales or interest from investors and provide other things of value. So, so the, you know, the, uh, there's a list of a lot of things we do and, you know, sort of the answer is whatever you're missing, that's what we do <laughs> with you, not for you. But our goal is to help grow companies. And, you know, that's sort of the fundamental, that's the big misimpression everybody gets. You know, they say, oh, you're here for money. No, <laughs> but money is part of helping to grow companies. Sure. You know, but it's not all get an investor. We have something called investor push where we help sell to investors and we have the the first couple steps of the sales sieve that we actually do for you in exchange for money. And, and we develop the marketing plan to sell to investors. We have a short course on how to sell to investors. It costs like you know, a couple hundred bucks to take it. Um, so, so, you know, we're trying to fill all the gaps that you have to help you do that. But ultimately, if you're going to succeed, you need a CEO who knows how to build a company and they need the team to do that. And we can help, fill the gaps until you have the team and you don't have the gaps. And then we can help in other ways as you um, <clears throat> mature the company, right? So, you know, when you start up, you're doing everything for the first time. You've never done it before. As you continue to do it, you get repeatable to where the same thing produces the same result, at least statistically. And you start to measure that and eventually get up to managed level where you're measuring it and using those measurements to adapt. And you're doing it in a predictive way. So you're saying, okay, I'm not generating enough um, things in this step of the sales sieve to generate the sales I need three months down the line or six months down the line. So I need to change something up here or else change the path from here to there. And it's the same thing in other aspects of managing your business. You need a systematic machine where you turn the cranks if you're going to scale. So we help grow companies. Thank, thank you very much, Fred. Were there other other questions for Fred? 
Perfect. Uh, Anita has graciously agreed to uh, uh, contribute a few minutes here and talk about the uh, convergence uh, accelerator. And this is uh, my fault. Uh, I, I just frankly wasn't aware of where we were in that project. Uh, had I been aware, uh, I would have certainly uh, uh, worked with uh, Anita and Deborah to get her on the schedule. But she's agreed graciously to give us a, a quick overview of what the uh, NSF Convergence Accelerator Program uh, is about in about a 15 minute time frame. And so if, uh, if she's the chair of the next panel, so her time is really hers. And uh, I don't have a problem with her going as long as she needs. Deborah, are you okay with uh, moving forward that way? Okay. Thank you, Anita. Why don't you go ahead and take the floor and, and thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Sure, I will, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to float between, since this is kind of last minute, uh, just kind of float between some of the materials from the accelerator and then maybe give my thoughts on it um, because this, this is a pretty well-funded program. So, excuse me, I'm going to share and um, show a slide first of all. Actually, give me, give me two seconds to set this up, sorry. And I think, are we going to go straight into the uh, panel after this? Yes, we don't have a okay. break. We have the panel as our next uh, okay. agenda Let item. Me, I just want to change this. Unless you need a short break, you can take, again, the time is yours. No, I just want to set this up. Okay. Um, let me, I added a slide, so I just want to use this as framing. I want to make sure folks can see this. <clears throat> My laptop's having issues. Can everybody see that, the slide that I have up? Okay. Um, so I'm going to go through... I brought up some of the actual materials from the accelerator. So the Convergence Accelerator is, I think it's in its third, maybe fourth year. I think it's actually third year. It's split into phases, um, phase one and phase two. So this is, a, it's a weird program. It's now in NSF's new directorate called TIP, um, which forgive me, technology, something, something partnerships. It's the new kind of NSF applied research, get real things out to the real world directorates. I think it's gonna be a billion dollar directorate. So um, this, this program is now in the convergent, is now in that directorate. So it's run by tracks. Each year they announce two, three, you know, tracks of interest. And that track will get a phase one. The phase one is multiple teams, maybe like, I don't know, 12, I think we had 12, somewhere between 10 and 15 teams, each get 750K. And then at the end, there's a pitch. If you get a phase two, so I'm in, I'm in the phase two, and you get $5 million, which is actually pretty substantial. Um, so the teams, here's some random things and I'll kind of go through some of the NSF material. The teams are uh, pretty big. You're supposed to be, this is all about converged research, which is this new term that's, you know, kind of there's interdisciplinary, then multidisciplinary. Now this is converged, which means in theory, you take really different disciplines and something great supposed to come out of it. Um, and th this, it's good until it isn't. There's a lot actually on the research side that's really interesting, but that's the premise is like get these wildly different people together, something awesome will happen. Um, so they pair the teams with the, with the venture capitalist who's your coach. So um, I'll go through this first and I'll talk about our project a little bit. So there's a structured curriculum. The first two years, I think they use IDEO, which I would have loved to have done that. They went actually, they went out to San Francisco. They went through, through IDEO, which is a big kind of design-ish type firm. Um, I know PIs that went through that and they um, were not sold on it, but actually going through it, they really liked it. They, they do a lot of design thinking and got people to think about a lot of the stuff Fred's been talking about. It's a little different now. Last year, NSF had its own curriculum. I call it like business school light. Um, you know, what, what is IP? What, what does it mean to talk to customers? I thought it was really great and targeted at kind of the right level for academics who don't have a business background. And I'll show you the curriculum a little bit. Um, this year, um, it's through Stanford, and actually NSF's licensing it from Stanford Business School, and each team has to pay to get access to it, which is a strange model. But in, in any case, it's a pretty. It, all these are great curriculums because they're 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 run by people who know this topic well. Uh, part of what they are emphasizing is this track integration to find synergies between different projects, and um, if you have some synergies, you can do something great. I don't think that this has yet worked because you're, you're kind of frenemies, right? And with the, with the different projects, you're really competing. A lot of the topics are very similar. So this track integration, not really clear what that means. I'll, I'll show you an example. 
Phase one to phase two is where a lot of these things fall apart. So phase one, you go through this, um, you know, curriculum, every, it's every week, which is pretty heavyweight for an academic PI. This is a lot of time. Um, so NSF actually allows them to spend more than their like two months a year. That's usually kind of your limit. So phase one to phase two are separate evaluations. I think this is where some of this falls apart. Um, so after phase one, you write a second proposal to get your 5 million. Um, potentially, you could join with other teams. Potentially, you could bring in um, different people. Potentially, you could change the focus of your um, product, which we, we had to do um, because NSF told us to. Um, but phase one to phase two are separate evaluations. Um, and then even in phase two, to get that 5 million, I, I think this is where it really falls apart. You have to write a traditional actually a 25 page proposal, which is pretty heavyweight. And then you have to do a marketing pitch. I love the pitch part. That was really cool. Um, these are separate people that evaluate these two things. Um, so writing a proposal that's a traditional like research style proposal for academics, but then doing a marketing pitch, it, it's, it, it's, it really takes two sides of the brain and it's a lot of work to do it. There's a lot of downsides to this program and I'll show you some of the other stuff. Um, Generally, even though they've said there's a BAA and it can be companies or nonprofits, in general, the projects tend to be run by researchers um, in general. Some of them aren't, but in general, by researchers with lots of co-PIs. Um, this leads to all the downsides with academic type projects where the PI is um, it's fairly hierarchical, where if you're not an academic, you maybe are, are you know, treated as, um, as secondary. I mean, I've seen this in a lot of the different teams. Um, a lot of people just don't grasp this concept that when you get $5 million, you don't have students coding a thing. Um, so that was one thing I really emphasized is if you're getting 5 million, we actually, we're, we're doing a game and I'll show you a little bit. And many of the teams realize this, but it's been slow. Use that money to hire professionals in this question of, well, where do you get these people? You know, that, that certainly is difficult either through the university or your network or, you know, PIs who, who know people. One of my co-PIs knew people from a gaming company. We hired them to, and, it, and they're super expensive, but you know, it is what it is if you're going to get a thing out there, but doing a convincing mostly within the NSF kind of PI culture that if you take, if you give, you know, a gaming company, let's just say a million dollars to code something, you're going to get a lot more benefits than having like undergrads or grad students coding. So that, that's, that's a downside that you have to convince people to spend the money on things like that and on marketing and on creating really slick, you know, one page or brochures. Uh, team dynamics can be challenging. I mean, NSF's pushing this uh, multi-disciplines and there's tension on every single team that I've seen uh, where some people really want to follow the academic way to producing things. Others are much more entrepreneurial. Um, these can be challenging and NSF will urge us to drop people for year two or year three and they will actually say they're detracting from this. So that, that's, a, that's kind of a mental model shift too. Um, the notion of a market is unappealing to most PIs in the program. Um, it, it's just, and I, I have some of this in the, in the rest of my presentation, but this notion that you have people who are going to use the thing is like, people just don't want to hear it. And a lot of this convergence curriculum is talking to users. Uh, finally, and I'll, I'll show a few things. Um, I, so I, the, the track I was part of or am part of um, is uh, inauthentic behavior, you know, fake news, disinformation. NSF did not want to fund a lot of this work. Um, that was a problem when I was an NSF program director. Uh, our project is part of this track. So a couple of things that came out of this is NSF's not publicized. They refused to publicize the projects because they were getting some public feedback about, you know, the government's funding the, the source of truth and being the oracle of truth and disinformation. Our product was actually a K through 12 learning project and um, we found from NSF and kind of in doing market surveys is this, this you know, th this isn't gonna work. Um, but that, that's a downside to NSF not publicizing projects, you know, that, that's not a good thing. So let me stop this share and show some other things. So that, that's like a very high level overview. Um, I'm gonna just show this welcome kit. I'm certainly not gonna go through it, but just to give you a flavor, just so if you're not familiar with it, um, this welcome kit. So in general, you know, like Doug, Doug Mon, who runs the program, he's, he's on almost all the calls with all the tracks. Um, this is just kind of the slick marketing. It, 
the model is, again, there's this ideation. You get into phase one, use a 750K to kind of figure out your product. Now you're in phase two, which means you've got to get a thing out. Um, this phase two, you know, I don't know how many times you can say minimum viable product and proof of concept, before, like, uh, you know, if you allow me to vent for a second, to me, this isn't a hard concept, but for PIs, um, you know, you've got to show your and NSF urges this, which seems rational to many of us, is you've got to show customers a product so that they know what the heck they potentially want to spend money on. Even, even if your customer's a nonprofit, this, um, this prototyping and minimum viable product is just like, I can't tell you how many people just disagree with this. It should be just people see we're super smart academics, just buy our thing. So phase two is really good because it takes you through this very structured, like, okay, what is a minimum viable product? What does that mean versus a proof of concept? There's got to be something that users can see. So it's supposed to be unique innovation, competition environment, uh, or coopetition. I haven't seen teams that get together, uh, but the multidisciplinary approach is, is probably a good one. Um, portfolio, okay, this is what I want to show folks. So I'm in track F, trust and authenticity and communication systems. Um, I will say, I guess this is being recorded, but I will, um, say that of the tracks of the six tracks now very few um real world impactful projects have come out of this i think there's been some super cool partnering and some very interesting research and but i think nsf still has a ways to go to figure out for example open knowledge networks many of the teams here the frustration is, okay, if you're going to create a, a thing that potentially a customer is going to pay money, a subscription base, let's say for, um, you know, kind of open data sets, why would people do that? Um, so kind of, there, there's some things where it's in theory, that's a really great idea, but in practice, it didn't really stick with customers. Um, and yeah, so th those are the tracks that, uh, there, there's one this year in 5G, which I think will be a little more successful. Um, so it's, it's an evolution. Um, okay, this is what I wanted to show. This is the curriculum. So it's all centered around this team science curriculum, which I think is, I think there's a lot. I've talked to Rob Beverly and NSFers to say there's a lot I think TTP can leverage. It's not an exact match, but there's things to be leveraged. The team science, um, you know, dynamics between how you create something, this human-centered design to really understand that. And I see this on my other NSF project where our team coded something. When when customers or users say, you know, I can't understand, it's not useful, we're like, well. Oh well, you, you can't use it, then you know, tough luck. But on the flip side, this is, you know, if customers can't use it, then nobody's gonna pay money or use it. And that's a that's a big thing. Uh, the pitching, I think, was a really great, I'll show you our pitch real quick. Um, everybody does storytelling now, but I think pitching in general, I, I don't know if it was Alec or, or somebody mentioned how maybe it was Angelos or Fred, how bad academics are at pitching. This is a really great exercise. So all through, and I think TTP can use this all through phase one of phase two, every three months or so, you have to refine your pitch. So it starts at a minute and then three minutes and then six minutes, and then it kind of, and then it goes back down to three minutes. This has been great because I know our uh, PI, you know, just to force people want to not have like a, a ton of text to pit. I mean, none of us are great at pitching in, if we're technical. This has been super useful. Um, I think what sometimes doesn't resonate is who you're communicating to that's tough in this program. Is it to, is it a stakeholder that somebody's going to pay for it or a stakeholder, somebody who's going to help you fund it? Um, but regardless, the, the pitching has been a really good exercise. Um, um, just a few things. Yeah. We, so there's some collaboration tools. Um, this is where, you know, I, I know Florence, some of you're working in kind of providing resources for the TTP teams. Conversions Accelerator has done this well. There's a Canvas set up, there's Slack between all the teams, not only within your track, but across tracks. Um, external partners get on that, and that that's been good to share resources or look back. Like, okay, what is a what does a marketing pitch look like? So, I like the fact that there's resources in in a place for people to uh, to get through. Um, I won't go through this, but just you know, again, it's a fairly structured curriculum every week to go through team science and design, and there's worksheets, um, some super cool stuff that that they re actually require you to do. It's not optional for phase two. And then there's an expo, which is by and large completely useless. Um, it was an expo in, in theory for the public, like maybe some VCs will come and throw money at us. And everything Fred said is right. Like 
you know, that that's just not going to happen. But it, you know, it's it's interesting, especially when it was in person to kind of walk around and see different things. Um, right. So I think that's it for that. Uh, this is our tr we have to do a track integration activity. Uh, ours was a toolkit um, because some people in our track are personally getting targeted because we're you know funding disinformation, the source of truth from the government. So this is like. How do we protect people from getting harassed for their their research which which is pretty useful um and then these are just kind of the some more about the curriculum i think that's it um just briefly maybe i'll show you our hours as like an example project um were you were you going to give your pitch um i'm gonna I'm going to maybe not give that let me see if I have the right one up let me see if I can do you, this you got three minutes. I mean, uh, <laughs> this is our new pitch and I haven't been the one do uh, they really want the PI to do it. I ultimately ended up giving the pitch, but it, this is good practice for our PI. Let me see if I can share this and do the pitch. Okay, hopefully you all can see that. So DART and Florence is actually on our advisory board. Thank you very much. So DART is our project, which is Deception Awareness and Resilience Training. You can see it's between a bunch of universities. It's led out of the University of Buffalo. I'm at the University of Illinois. And we have experts from various universities. So our team is comprised of people who know security, disinformation. We have one of the world's leading experts on deep fakes. And we have people who have done a security education, very structured curriculum for students. So our value proposition is uh, we know that senior citizens are targeted by scams, whether it's disinformation or IRS scams, uh, disproportionately seniors are targeted. Um, the FBI reported that in 2020, seniors, and these are people who reported the loss, lost a billion dollars through scams, and they're just getting more sophisticated. Um, I personally work on something called pig butchering, which is a romance scam that involves crypto, and more and more we're seeing that 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 seniors are just targeted. So what's DART? Um, DART, we, we wanna gamify the approach to senior citizens. Senior citizens, you know, they don't wanna necessarily be, be taught. They don't wanna be talked down to. They don't wanna be thought, be thought of as vulnerable. So we do wanna make something that's engaging and interactive and gamified, that's relevant. And we wanna teach them without them knowing that they're being taught about what to look for in scams. So there's a lot of deceptions that target older adults. Um, if, 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 you, if you're a caregiver or you, you work with older adults or are around them, um, there's a lot of deceptions specifically these days targeting them. Older adults have time on their hands. Uh, many of them are connected. They may not be savvy internet users, but most people have some sort of phone or be connected in some way. Again, you can see some of these, these uh, this is from the FBI, again, a, a billion dollars in losses. And it, from the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission gets an report to this, uh, older adults clearly have, are becoming victims. Some of these are the, some of the most popular scams that uh, are seen, like I have your son, send me money or else, you know, you're, you're not gonna get him back. So we're proposing a game and the game, uh, these are actually some of the graphics, our, our, uh, our advisor said this, it's a little uh, Carmen San Diego ish but you know, we're, you're targeting uh, older citizens on a, by and large on a mobile phone because many aren't using the internet using a tablet or a mobile phone so something that's lightweight something that's kind of retro and something that is we're not trying to teach you but we want to help you act and uh, go against fang the evil people who are trying to scam you so we have walter fang is um is one side of the game and, and you're a dart agent you can pick your flavor of agent and you're going to help identify some of the trickery this is with a gaming company who understand things like, um, how do you get rewarded within a game so that you stay in the game and that, that it's fun. Um, it, it, gaming people know how to incentivize you to stay within these games. So this is kind of what it looks like. You can choose your operation. You can choose your mission. What we have, because we do want to teach people without them necessarily think they're being taught. So we have some side games. And if you play these side, these are supposed to be like two, three minute games, um, similar to Sudoku or something like this. You gain points and you can get to another level uh, and we found you can incentivize people even if you're not a big gamer um, these are kind of fun to play to do these side games and the side games the themes of these are scams so the sudoku or some of the crosswordy type things uh, which by the way are in the font for senior citizens 
uh, the, these are all around disinformation themes. There's a lot of stuff out there. Most of it is not that good. Um, the, the State Department put out this cat park, which is mysteriously, really hilariously bad as to why some lady's trying to fight putting a cat park in her neighborhood. So we try to make this better. Uh, our challenge is distribution. How do you get to seniors? Uh, it, this is an unsolved challenge. Uh, AARP agreed to probably put us on their website. The FTC likes what we're doing. Um, but again, getting to seniors, again, within our team, this is a, a, we were bifurcated of, well, people can just go to the library and learn. The downside is, well, if you go to a library to learn about disinformation, you're probably not on the internet getting scammed. So within our team, we're trying to figure out what's a reasonable way to get to seniors. Um, eventually, what we'd like to get to are scams that affect places like banks, insurance companies, and enterprises. There's a lot of security training. There's not a lot of great training on scams, disinformation, and that kind of thing. But we're starting with senior citizens. This is our team. And uh, yeah, our first, our, our proof of concept is gonna be out in March. So that's, that's one example of the accelerator. Are you looking for feedback on your pitch? Uh, yeah, I, I, I did not do this pitch, so that's, but yes, uh, please. Well, so the, the simplest feedback is the first slide was missing contact information. Your problem and solution should have been on one slide or two with the problem, including the size of the market, which you said, but you didn't have on the slide to see. Your solution was obviously a worthwhile and good solution, right? Oh, great. And then you spent minutes and minutes and minutes on the game technology. And then <clears throat> at the end told us that the problem is distribution and told us nothing about the finances, nothing uh, detailed about the team and how they could solve this problem. You should have the distribution problem at least solved in an initial form before you do the presentation and explain how you're going to get to market, how quickly and how it's going to accelerate with time and how you're going to make money. And then there's all the risk issues, right? So, and, and I don't want to go into too much time on that here, but we have a standard evaluation process that we use and, and a, a tool that we use to do those evaluations. So if you send me your pitch deck, I, I'll be happy to go through it, but I will tell you that it's going to be almost all red and you'll have like a 12% a out of 100. I, I wrote all that down because I <laughs> love that feedback. So I, if, when I start my next uh, bit, uh, again, th this is the issue with the academic versus uh, you are not. And when the academics are the ones forced to do this, uh, Fred, I love that feedback. So let me just ask you, why is it, that the academics in these cases aren't forced by the acceleration program to engage with the other expertise that they need? I think you answer the question by saying forced to. It's suggested many times. I, I, I saw when I start my other pitch, I, I mean, I have, I, I'm at my second startup in the past few years. I mean, when we pitch to customers, it is a hundred totally different type of pitch. Um, yeah. But it is seen as we are trying to Okay, the positive side, NSF sees us as we're trying to lead the, lead the horse to water, lead the academics. The negative side is if you're not willing to be led, it, you're not going to change this. this is, by the way, this deck is like a thousand times better than the one we started with. And I think um, NSF should be more prescriptive. Finally, within our team, our PI is like, maybe I'm not the best one to give this pitch. Um, uh, for various reasons, he's wonderfully smart. Uh, but you know, I'll just say not a native English speaker's English isn't great, <clears throat> which is fine. But when you're giving a pitch, it's a little choppy. So it, it, it doesn't hurt. No. So all this can be trained relatively easily. Pitching is like the easiest thing to do. Yeah. That you know, it's a it's a training, a teaching thing. There are standard approaches to pitches to even have timing associated with each of the different subjects in the pitch and lists of the slides. You can do that. The challenge is that you need something good to pitch and you have a good idea, but you don't have a business model to take it to market yet. So that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. That was... when, you say, when you say not mandated, right. To me, if they're going to give you the money and, and its purpose is what this purpose is asserted to be, then a condition of the money is that in your proposal, members of the team include marketing people, right? Sales people, somebody, you know, you need, and this is a lot of money. 750K is a lot of money for a startup. That's as much as an angel investment group 
will put into a substantial company that's been started up and has been running for three to five years and finally has everything in place to be able to be successful. So I, it, I, NSF has to be more prescriptive. We got 5 million in October and a good chunk of that was put towards students and postdocs, even though NSF said, do not use students. We spent half of our first in-person meeting. Thank goodness it was in front of NSF with one of the PIs griping about how her student couldn't publish papers. At that point, it's like, you know, I, I appreciate that. Your student needs to do that, but that shouldn't be part, that shouldn't be my core topic to talk about at a PI meeting. Yeah. yeah, the pity of it is that it's a great idea. And you probably have, you know, a team that knows the right influence operations to do. You know, on our radio show, we have every week, we have a section on fraud, spies, and lies that goes through one. Okay. Walks through an actual fraud and, and you know, I talk about it and then I have the computer voice generating what came in the email and so forth, right? But, but there's lots of ways to do this. I, I even have a gaming company that would love to have just a small portion of that money to turn that into a game that they can sell and they know how to sell it, right? So let me ask you this. So, you know, I feel like every time we talk to, to people like you or others, it moves to need a little bit where the PIs are like, oh, I guess that is good feedback. So what, what do you think it's just like, the, we just need to give this over and over to get feedback from people like you who really know the real deal? Or like, how, how would you influence a PI who just isn't accepting feedback? And it's not just our PI, it's across the board. Right, so when you say is not accepting feedback, right? Um, we have the same problem with CEOs, right? And, and investors run away from CEOs who don't listen and don't act on what they hear and understand. That doesn't mean they do what, what somebody suggests, but it means they address the issue and so forth. And, and so my, my view of it is part of the team has to be somebody whose job it is to do that, right? I mean, that's what Angel to Exit does, right? We help grow companies. We don't help grow research projects, although sometimes that's part of growing a company. And, and so if you don't have a company bent, then you're not going to ultimately get a scalable solution that's going to be able to go global and make a significant change to the world. Uh, the other option is religion, right? <laughs> so so uh, you, could, you could do the religious version of, by the way, religion's a really good way to get people to counter frauds. Um, but the problem is that a lot of the fraudsters use religion as the path to doing the frauds. I think one of the core issues of the accelerator, just to, to wrap up this part, is the tension between doing something that's uh, either profitable, sustainable, and social good. So half our team, and I firmly believe senior citizens should be educated, um, but I think that's just one step. And there are people who just honestly don't think we should be making a profit and we should just code this thing, walk away, and go on to the next thing, which is well, fine, well right? But well, but, but in that case, you know, license it out, you know, to one of right, my companies exactly. and they'll go make a profit. But, That's what but Gamer said, yeah. But, but here's the thing, and this is what I think the PIs and the people that have good things in their mind need to come to understand. It's that, so, so with all this money, you created something potentially beautiful and nobody's ever going to see it. Right. Now, we have, you know, what, 8 billion people in the world, so about a billion of them are seniors. We need to get this to a billion people. The seniors, you know, that we're trying to help don't necessarily have the money to pay for it. Some of them do, some of them don't. But there's lots of ways to help those seniors in other ways. For example, those seniors also have products and services they need. And there are channels like AARP that bring this as a value to those seniors. So there are ways to monetize this, which allows you the money you need to pay to grow it to support all the employees you're going to need to make it work for a billion people. Sure. So if you, if you don't, if the PIs don't get engaged in that successful business to where people can get paid for what they do, then it's not going to do the help that they want done for the people that want, that they want to help. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. part That's of the problem point. is every one of these investigators has a salary. They're, yeah. getting, they're getting paid the same amount, whether this is a successful endeavor or not. Exactly. So, so they have no financial motivation um, to do this. 
you know, and, and I think it's great that they publish papers. I like universities. I think it's a great model, <clears throat> but the university itself has to have the incentives lined up. The NSF as the funding agency has to have its incentives lined up. The researchers that are developing in this case, something to help people need to have the goal of helping those people, not just figuring out how to help them, but actually helping them. <laughs> so, you know, you just need to align all the interests to get it to work well. When I say just have to, that's like the hardest problem in the world. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, that's super helpful. And I'm, I'm gonna, I will send you our pitch as we iterate on it. This, this feedback's been great. I'm taking some notes. Thank you very much. Let me, yeah. let me just not, not lose one quick thought, Anita. The, the, the great pitch and the fact that the pitch is allowed to grow and then has to be compressed. At least in my view, compressing information like that is an extremely valuable thing to do because it forces you to think about what's important. I've recently started allowing students to bring a cheat sheet into exams. They want to bring in open notes. I don't let them do that. What I would let them do is to, to compress all their notes into one page handwritten. And that's what I let them bring into it because compressing information makes you optimize and find what's important. And, and going through it then in a group like this is, is very helpful. So I'll stop with that and let you have your, return your time to the member there, as they say. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, and it helps with the optometrist too, because if you write really tiny, you need glasses to read it. Um, Anita, just one quick thing. And when I, when I talk to your team again, I think we're gonna talk on the 20th. This is, this need for what I'm calling like digital Sherpas comes up in a number of places. You and I may have talked about this before because we're working on the clinical IoT stuff. And if you're trying to enable trust and identity and privacy and the device is trying to figure something out for you and you're a senior citizen or you can't see or you can't hear or whatever, you know, if there's a, a challenge. You know, when I think about the candy stripers we had years ago, <laughs> you know, that would help patients. And so we're thinking about this idea from the healthcare perspective, from the community perspective, and this is a community element. So we can talk about this separately, but I feel like like having a nonprofit who helped, you know, with situations like this, where you're teaching people how and helping them, you know, work with technology. I think there's a real opportunity there. And, and I think would probably have to be a nonprofit. I don't know what it would be, but it might be interesting to think about that as a model. Yeah, that's that's great. That's, you know, we're, we're open to any and all ideas to get this out. So yeah, that, um, I look forward to having you talk to our team. I'm so glad you're on our advisory board. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, let me share this. Uh, so much of what I had put on these slides has been said already. So I'm not, I'll, I'll try not to repeat things. And hopefully, hopefully you can see that. Okay, um, so I'll try to go through this because uh, I know we're, we're getting short on time. Uh, what didn't work, and I went through some of this with the convergence thing. So um, so my, my background, um, I formerly, I'm at UIUC now, formerly I was at NSF, I uh, helped really, Kevin Thompson brought this idea over from DHS and I kind of rounded it out. And then with help from Vaughn and, and from Florence, we kind of rounded it out. Um, I'm also one of the organizers. I, I bring this up for a couple of reasons, the AI Village, DEF CON AI Village. Um, because there's a lot of stuff we do that is transitioned to practice, although we have no funding, it's all just kind of crowdsourced. As I said, I'm in the conversion Accel accelerator phase two. Um, I have a DARPA SPIR phase two, not for DART, but for um, my project through Inca Digital, which is a startup. Um, so I was part of a startup that got sold in May. It was acquired by the CBOE in Chicago. It's a cryptocurrency futures exchange. And now I'm part of a startup called Inca Digital. Uh, which is, has a lot of customers and it's also funded by DARPA, so it's SBIR phase two. So it's, um, just some random observations. Uh, again, a lot of these have been said. Uh, by the way, I, this I had to put, because I, I think of this constantly with uh, some of the people, you know, we, uh, it's great when we are in totally different disciplines and there's no, you know, competition. Um, but sometimes with this uh, cross, cross track thing, same field, same topic, you know, we're, we're bitter enemies. There's not really a lot of competition. So here's some things, um, confusing messaging for TTP, the funding stream. Uh, this is, uh, I, I, I saw Rob Beverly earlier this weekend and he was on yesterday. The funding stream has to be sorted out. This has not worked. So the vehicle to get largely to get transition of practice projects in has been secure and trustworthy cyberspace, which Jeremy talked about yesterday. Yet yeah, that funding within SATSE is funded by, I should have broken up this acronym, the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. That office, the focus is on, by and large, scientific cyber infrastructure. So 
in, in prior years when the transition of practice was written in, there was this caveat, yes, it's got to be used within scientific cyber infrastructure writ large. The R&E community, uh, it, it had to be shoehorned in, written through the broad security program, but shoehorned in to satisfy this focus. That that just doesn't work. It, it just, it, it, SATSE needs to either commit to funding it or not. Uh, now there's a lot of, you know, where does this fit in with i SBIR, Convergence, and now you have regional innovation engines and all this other stuff. Where does TTP fit in? There's a lot of time spent, you know, explaining this is confusing. The structure has been confusing. So it's changed a few times. Uh, first, uh, you know, because you got to see what sticks. So first it was a TTP option. And what this meant is um, a PI got a, um, a, a secure and trustworthy cyberspace project funded. Then optionally, they could say, when I put in the proposal, I want to option this and maybe transition something. It could work, it didn't, because by and large, it was just like, give me the money and I'll just do whatever with it. Um, so kind of structurally, when you get a two, three year project, you don't know if you can transition it. So this option didn't work. As a standalone, it's worked okay. I think it should be step one for a larger effort, potentially, or not. Um, and I'll talk about that. And in essence, the role in the pipeline of getting stuff out has got to be made more clear. Um, expectations, I mean, doing this at NSF, um, mixed unaligned expectations. So who's the end user? Constantly we went through this. Um, I can't tell you how many times it was like, well, the end users, the people in my department, okay? Or, you know, it's at my university. Okay, that's not a bad thing, but, you know, is that the expectation that if everybody in your computer science department uses it, you've transitioned something? You know, maybe, probably not though. The PI's expectation is great. TTP means I get more money. Um, if it doesn't succeed, that's part of life. So there's not an incentive to get a thing out there, talk to users. Um, largely what I saw is people just used it to fund students and just kind of mixed in the money with the research and just, if it didn't work out, oh well. NSF, uh, and their, from their point of view, success would be great, but they wrestle with what that means for TTP. Um, expectations of things like code quality, almost across the board in the projects that Rob brought up, even until Zeke became a company, you're talking grad student code, um, which could be okay, right? If, you know, if you're using kind of master students maybe, but um, code quality, supportable long-term patching, payments to Amazon, uh, angry users, like these things are just not factored in. Those expectations, even I see in the convergence thing, are just not aligned with what NSF is saying. Uh, lack of buy-in, that's huge. So NSF, especially SATSE, is just not sold on the usefulness. For four solid years, I argued when I was at NSF, and still most people don't believe that it's useful because the belief, which I don't disagree with, is NSF funds basic research. We should not fund things to get in the real world. That's anathema to this new directorate. That's just not how the world works. Um, but you need a champion, and there just there, there aren't a lot of champions with it. Cross-agency can work well. Um, Mike Posmentier, who's at NSF now, when he was at DHS, we worked very well across agencies, but we would personally spot something and say, hey, do you want to co-fund this? And you know, we knew that the PI could get something out there. So cross-agency can work well. Um, you know, multiple successes. Um, fund transfer can be, can be challenging, but that, that actually worked well. Formerly, there was a round table between agencies. Oh, they don't do that now. I think DARPA's overlooked. Uh, always looking for transition partners, TTP. I always felt should do more at DARPA. Uh, I won't belabor this point. We talked about a lot the past two days, but business terms scare a lot of the TTP folks. Um, what I saw mostly were these phrases and this, everyone's a potential market. Like, okay, that's not entirely true. If you're gonna talk to users, not everyone is your market. And saying no one else does this. Okay, well, that's hardly ever true. I think there's an unwillingness to try very low risk. Like there's this, as we all know, NSF, there's a focus on novelty. There's not a willingness to do boring but potentially impactful transitionable things and these are just examples i've seen that don't make money but you know, like the miter attack model you know it, it's it's boring it's a framework but it's the basis for a lot of really cool themes um atlas was something i worked on with microsoft and ai village it was a taxonomy of ai attacks boring didn't make money but you know that could be the basis for products to be built upon that so this very low risk um kind of boring stuff Governance risk compliance tools. 
Um, these are things that are research intense, but um, again, kind of boring things that people don't want to, I guess, use their time on. Uh, also on the flip side, um, unwillingness to try very high risk, uh, both on the part of the PIs and CISOs. And I totally get on the part of CISOs, but uh, at DARPA years ago when Mudge, uh, prior to Twitter, when he was at uh, DARPA, he would give out these small micro grants, um, just a small grant uh, to try something out where, um, you know, PIs that were not necessarily academics would get uh, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars to try something out. Uh, and if it is transitionable, then they could kind of figure it after that. And some topics are just off limits to NSF, like the, the fake news topic. Um, traditional NSF PI culture, um, you know, that kind of doesn't work. The timescales are just misaligned. Proposal timeline, even though SATSI TTP doesn't have due dates, I think, anymore, the timeline versus a hot idea, uh, wildly out of sync. And writing a proposal takes a ton of time and structure and overhead. And um, this traditional culture is not aligned well with TTP. Um, again, use of students, unwilling, uh, the unwillingness uh, to really talk to and listen to operators and CISOs, I, I see that all the time. I think, I mean, Fred, correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe this is an old statistic, but I think, you know, CISOs have something like 26 tools that they're, that, you know, your, your average SOC has something like 26 tools to help their operators. There's two over way, way more than that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is years ago. But there's so many tools, CISOs are getting vendors all the time, but at the end of the day, you need to talk to them. What's, what's the actual problem they're trying to solve? And I mean, that this is a classic problem, but I see this, especially in TTP, like you need to sit and hear feedback, like you gave me, like your idea is okay, but you're pitching it. it, it doesn't sound good. What are you really doing? And just the time and interest in getting connected to that, uh, that doesn't jive with the traditional culture. Accelerator went through that. Okay, so that's uh, that's my few minutes. A lot of it's been said before, but uh, we want to hear from the other two panels and panelists. And I got some questions. Um, so Florence, uh, I put your, I think this is your official title, Executive Director of Northeast Big Data Hub, among other things. And then Vaughn, uh, form, former Director of Trusted CI. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Florence. Okay, great. Here we go. Close all these other things here. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Big clear letters was my goal. <laughs> so thank you so much for inviting me to join this auspicious group. This is very important and we haven't figured it out yet. So with all these brilliant, experienced, wise people who are not afraid to communicate, I'm hoping we could come out with some new ideas today that will help us move things forward. Or maybe in the future, maybe it'll spur something. So I like to look at, you know, what has not worked and where do we go from here? You know, so what recommendations do we have? So very high level, you know, what's the journey? And I call it the journey and the speed bumps, a lot of speed bumps in TTP, right? So from the NSF perspective, a PI submits a research proposal, maybe TTP, maybe a TTP extension, the proposal's funded or a speed bump if it's not funded. I've spoken to many researchers who are just so bereft all the time. They call me when they're depressed. I didn't get funded. I did the TTP extension. I did this, I did that. Very difficult. They keep trying. Then they, uh, the researcher looks for a target user, speed bump if they don't know any, right? How do I find them? Who, what do they need? Why don't they need what I, what I, what I make? I don't get it. They really need this, right? Um, and many times it's a solution looking for a problem is what I find. So how do you find a problem that needs a solution? <laughs> So some of the efforts I've been involved in, I have to thank Anita for getting me involved in the first one, uh, and all of these actually, um, was an eager that we put together on uh, cybersecurity TTP acceleration. That's when I met Alec, we met in DC. And uh, this is you know, right out of what we had in the eager. NSF encourages security researchers of promising applied research projects to submit uh, TTP projects. And while some take advantage of this opportunity, others lack information about how to identify early adopters of that technology. That's ongoing. Even TTP researchers I work with for years now, you know, I keep in touch with a few of them. They just still don't like, they, they just look at me vacuously when we talk about it. Like, well, who would use it? Would this type of person use it? Well, maybe. Well, who would really love this? I don't know. 
you know, and it's very hard to get there. And if you leave the witness too much, then you might not, you might be making it up. So it's very difficult discussion. And so our goal was to have an outreach vehicle to get to CIOs and university campuses and all this other stuff. So we did outreach and workshops um, for TTP researchers with CIOs, you know, with CI professionals, industry professionals, more speed bumps. So we hosted matchmaking workshops um, CIOs and CI professionals are concerned with deploying unproven security technologies. Good choice, right? You know, we're dealing in a, a risk averse and increasingly risky environment. So, you know, just to be practical about this, it was difficult to explain the practical operational value of the new security research assets and how we would clearly mitigate any risk associated with deploying it. You know, very risky, very risk averse. Um, researchers didn't necessarily design their research to solve a known, identified, enunciated user problem. You know, it could be that we all think we're Steve Jobs, and after everybody realizes how great it is, it's going to take off. But it was very hard, um, and to be able to do that with a user, to work the solution together, have a user that could do that with. Now, Vaughn actually anteed in the folks he worked with, which made a real difference in a couple of the assets. But there aren't a lot of people like that that we know that would do that. So how did we address the speed bumps and results? We actually named an innovation fellow who was a higher ed CIO to lead the CIO engagement effort, including creating an agreement for CIOs to sign with the security researcher. Once again, everybody was allergic to it. <laughs> they weren't gonna sign it. Um, still too much risk deploying an unknown asset in a risk averse and increasingly risky security environment. So then further efforts, that's when Vaughn said, hey, Florence, you wanna help us do this? I'm like, sure, let's keep giving this a try, right? Um, and so we created this TTP program together, and it's still on the website. And you saw some of the assets yesterday um, that Deborah presented. You know, the Canvas and uh, the TTP Canvas and the the TRL model. And we hosted more workshops. Still, user reticence to try unproven cybersecurity research for multiple reasons. What's the risk mitigation plan? Who's the ongoing development and troubleshooting team? One researcher and a student, really? That's what you want me to bet my future on? You know, these are some of the, the practical side of what I was hearing and who will fund the ongoing development and what if the researcher is no longer doing it or the, you know, the dollars dry up. Um, and so, you know, we created a couple of these models that you saw yesterday, uh, these tools, the TRL tool and the Canvas tool. And some research collaboration asset testing was accomplished with industry and academia, but it didn't go too far. Vaughn knows better, you know, the results of the work that he did. So what I've done since I'm an advocate for this is that I've stayed in touch with a few of these researchers. Um, and so I help, so I just call myself a TTP advocate so it wasn't all about me. Um, I'm sure all of us do this. Provide forums for researchers to present their work, identify potential collaborators and funding, enable broader impact, including student engagement. Maybe the students will decide to do something with this. Maybe it'll have a longitudinal you know, opportunity. Um, so some of the things we've done is invited, um, there's an IOT security researcher that we had in the TTP workshop in Chicago we did in 2019, and we invited him to present to an IEEE working group that I lead on trust, identity, privacy, protection, safety, and security for IOT. Result of that is one of the NIH participants was interested in learning more, but that's, they had one more meeting and that was about it. Um, we invited them also to present their quantum technologies and techniques at, uh, techniques at the Blockchain and Healthcare Today and Tomorrow Symposium. And so it's actually on demand on the website at this Blockchain and Healthcare Today and Telehealth and Healthcare Today um, website. So the word is out there a little bit more. Um, this researcher also worked with their tech transfer office and they did some subject matter expert interviews. And so I was interviewed to talk about what could the value proposition be, who might you know users be, where, they, where might they transition this. Um, we also invited some of the TTP researchers in my region, in the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub region, to compete for seed grants. And I recused myself, and two of them actually got seed grants. Um, and then we also invited one of them, one of the researchers who does secure multi-party computation, to speak on one of our events, the National Student Data Corps, where we have like 3,400 students that we communicate with, and they learn about data science and things like that. So we're trying to like take these little gems and and shine light shine a light on them when we can. As I mentioned, initial discussions with industry and NIH, you know, started, um, but we really um, haven't gone very far. There was some of these seed grants they got, which helped push things, and most of what I've been able to help them with is student engagement. Um, and these are some of the reference points. So where do we go from here? <laughs> so ongoing TTP challenges, funding technology readiness for real, 
including the risk mitigation and user partnerships. These are all challenges. So I like the idea that Anita brought up and as she's talking about the convergence accelerator models to consider bringing TTP to the new NSFT TIP directorate. It's not just for cybersecurity, it could be for other assets as well. Um, it has technology and innovation and partnerships, which is all needed. It's not just the technology side, which is where we tend to focus in size and OEC. Um, they can leverage learnings from SBIR and STTR, which I think TIP owns now too. They could work broadly across all of NSF and maybe get some learnings and then leverage the TTP knowledge that exists in Doug Mon and Mike Posmentier, you know, the, the guys that have done it at DHS before. Another element of that could be, and Fred kind of has one of these, build an NSF TTP community, including TTP researchers and advocates to like mentor and coach them. It's kind of like the i crowd that maybe it's a little bit different, or maybe it's an extension of that. You know, maybe, you know, like some of us could be on that and we could be, um, when people are ready, we can come in and, you know, it's kind of like quick consulting, mentoring and coaching, right? Show me, send me your CV, you know, send me, send me your pitch deck. Tell me what you've done. These are the five questions you have to answer. And then, you know, we give them a little, uh, a little insight and we're there as a trusted advisor. You know, maybe there's some way to fund something like that. Um, it's kind of like an IUCRC, but it's, I don't know, something. Um, and then separately, and I've suggested this to some of the other uh, researchers, leverage their university alumni angel groups. When they, But the technology has to be ready because they're like a VC. They're like, I'm going to invest in this if I think it's going to have an exit, right? That's really what they're looking for unless it's mission-based or it's a combo. So that's a high-level view of, of what I'm thinking because I feel like we need to change the questions a little bit and change the answers a little bit. I think continuing to go down, you know, um, the the... I don't call it a rabbit hole, but continuing to um, just look at, well, you got a TTP award, you should be transitioning this thing. What's your problem? You know, find a user. That's really not working. And they're not personally incentive, not just financially incentive, some of them. So that that's my uh, my high level view. I hope that was helpful. Super helpful. Um, I'm going to transition to Vaughn and then we'll do some questions for both of you. Vaughn, are you ready to queue up your presentation? We saw right. your deck, we did not hear you. Yeah, sorry, for some reason I could share and then I couldn't unmute. So we're gonna share and we're gonna unmute. Yeah, and I had this experience before. Uncheck the box that does the audio from what you're sharing so it won't disable your microphone. All right, okay, can you both hear me and see my slides now? Yes, yes. can. All right, yes. excellent. Um, so thank you for this this moment to um, to put together some thoughts and to chat about them. I'm hoping for some some feedback here. I am admittedly going to go down a kind of esoteric rat hole, uh, which some of you may care about and some of you not. Hopefully, for those of you who don't care about, you'll find it an interesting journey, even if you find it a completely bizarre land that I'm going into. Um, and I'm in particularly entitling this something that's not working well. Um, as a smart colleague in distributed systems convinced me of a while, you know, things that work well are good. Things that are completely broken are also fine. They're obviously completely broken. Nobody spends any time on them. But things that kind of are broken are a real problem because they'll fool you into thinking they're working. People will waste time on them. And they can actually sort of create a much bigger problem than things that are completely broken. And so what I really want to talk about is what I'm calling TTP within NSF. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. And so what I am talking about is NSF being the customer of its own TTP. Oh. So for example, you can imagine something coming out of say SATSE going through the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, you know, CI programs, TTP programs. And then as Anita has alluded to a couple of times, NSF actually in the support of its scientific mission runs a huge amount of computing infrastructure, cyber infrastructure, whatnot, right? And one of the discussions I've had with NSF over the years is, well, does TTP into NSF count? And we've sort of tried this. So for example, can we uh, you know, create a new capability and then get it used by the Gemini Observatory or something like that? And so my hope with this presentation is to argue that this is something that is fairly broken, 
which is actually a really worse thing. And I wish it would either completely break and NSF would just said, no, we, this, let's just take this off the table in terms of our TTP discussions, or I'm gonna give a vision for how it might be fixed. I'm not saying it's worth fixing, but I'm gonna sort of argue how it might be fixable. So just a couple counter examples to clarify what I'm not talking about. So sometimes NSF can help develop something and then piggyback off its broader adoption by the world. Zeke's a perfect example of that. NSF gets huge amounts of benefit in its infrastructure from, from Zeek, Tripwire, all sorts of these other technologies, but those were like hugely adopted by the rest of the world. NSF's just piggybacking on scale there. That's not what I'm talking about. NSF can also piggyback on the higher ed community. And the higher ed community is very good. Basically, they'll figure out they've got a common problem amongst, say, a bunch of CIOs. Those CIOs will get together. I'll figure out how to chip in 20, 50, $100,000 a year or something, start a consortium, develop a solution and then support it. And sometimes NSF can piggyback off of that. So for example, identity management and shibboleth and in common, right? And NSF can piggyback off of, off of that solution. I'm not even talking about that sort of space where NSF is piggybacking. I'm asking you to accept and there's a whole other debate that can be had here. And, and I'm not 100% convinced of this, by the way, but I'm fairly convinced that NSF has some peculiar needs around its peculiar infrastructure. You know, global scientific collaboration, data distribution, uh, high performance, this, the, that's networks, sensor networks, all this sort of weird scientific stuff. And except for the moment that there are some peculiar cybersecurity needs around that, and NSF would like to solve those, you know, great model, something comes out of SATSE, goes through TTP, CI, CI, and then gets deployed. Is this sort of a possibility is what I want to talk to. And what, what are the problems with this happening today? Let's see. So just recapping the, the broader and higher ed models, just so I can contrast them here. You know, the broader commercial space, I think we've been over it. You've got R&D, you've got VC, you've got actual customers. This is a well-known path. The higher ed model, you get agreement need to CIOs form a little coalition. They form organization, they collect dues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing I do want to point out there is I am here, you know, we've had a little bit at times it's easy to talk about universities as sort of monolithic organizations. I want to make a big distinction here about the difference between the administrative side of a university, which is where I put CIOs in, and say the more academic faculty side of a university. CIOs, the administrative side, are pretty good at organizing and collaborating around this across universities in a way that is different than, I'm gonna, than I would argue on the faculty side. So what happens with the internal to NSF model? Um, so we've got R&D that gets started, say, in SAPSI. It starts out as a you know, PI grant. Then the model is, well, then you can take it to the CICI, the Cybersecurity Innovation for Cyber Infrastructure, or TTP or something. And then it starts getting a little strained. It, you start talking about sort of, now, how do you support um, this, this thing once it, once it gets realized. So let's say you, you create uh, the world's best um, cybersecurity solution for securing IoT, you know, ecological device sensors uh, for neon or something, right? And customers love you. So let's say you, you've got all that sorted out and this is just sort of a question, well, what's your business model? Well, how do you sustain that now? Well, there's kind of, you can try to sort of get subcon, you know, let's assume for a moment, you're not gonna go off, create a whole new outside business, though maybe you should. You can get subcontracts from those NSF projects. They can sort of pay you as they would kind of any other academic researcher. You can go try to go get ongoing R&D grants from NSF. So there's always this little game we play. Well, um, really this is about sustaining my work, but we're going to paint it with a veneer of innovation, right? So I can apply for a grant to sort of keep it going. Um, and one thing I wanna point out here, because this is a relatively limited market, my argument is, you know, I think there's a couple reasons why people try to drive things to practice. Um, one, we've kind of talked about is sort of the capitalistic model. They want to either, you know, make money off of it. I'm not value judging that, but make money off of it. 
or maybe they want to start a business. I've seen people who are just in love with the creation of businesses themselves. I like being entrepreneurs. I'm going to argue none of that really applies in this space. It's going to be more the mission driven side of, of things. These people are doing it because they want to have impact on the scientific infrastructure. And there's some uh, emotional driven uh, uh, motivation that they've got around that. But but the key thing about that is that you're going you're going to shed uh, potential members of your community in doing that. Uh, you know the folks who are interested in making money or starting a big business or having something, as Fred said, that scales uh, largely aren't going to be all that interested in playing in this small pond. So why does this not work well? And I qualify it not work well because we do have examples of it working. Uh, Jim Basney's CI logons had success here. We've got HT Condor, Pegasus, Globus, sort of outside the security space. I argue that all of those things are essentially hero efforts. Um, they're not easily reproducible. Those are all being done by folks that are not your typical uh, faculty academics. In some cases, like Jim Basney, he's not faculty. You know, he's research staff. Um, others here have got, I think, some very incredible internal support. And I think all of these are very precarious. I think all of these organizations, based upon my, my discussions with them, have serious challenges with succession planning. Uh, you know, you're not going to go find a CEO in the private sector space that's going to come in and take over one of these companies when the current uh, person uh, retires or wins the lottery or, or decides they, they'd rather go off into the private sector. And so it, it's a feel, it's a very tenuous situation. And it's, I don't think anyone is comfortable with the reliability uh, of any of these, of these particular uh, projects. And so why? Um, and I'll, I'll either uh, thank or blame Anita here for causing me to formalize my I, I've had an anecdote for years that I call the Welch's rule of NSF workshops, which is any NSF workshop will eventually discuss changes to tenure or changes to the NSF funding process if it goes on long enough. Uh, I think we've well already um, uh, added another validation to my rule there, and I'm going to you know, just dump in even deeper um, on that. Um, so first, we've talked about the misalignment with the academic mission, I, I think, quite a bit. I'm, I'll, I'll just add one little bit of perspective to that, in that having sat in, in a couple different universities and tried to do these sorts of things, I will say the business processes of universities kind of suck uh, doing things like that. Trying to get invoices cranked out, trying to get contracts done, all of these kind of different things. And like I said, it works just well enough that you can fool yourself into thinking it works uh, and then has a way of letting you down at really key times. I'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, it, as opposed to the nice thing is I, I've always had the dream if I go off and start my own company. Well, the nice thing is, is, is my chief legal officer reports to me and I can always get front in their queue as opposed to if I sit in the university and I'm now, you know, eight, number 87 in line at the deli when I need legal help. Um, there's misalignment with funding. You know, we've, we've also already talked about this. I think it gets even more problematic here when you're trying to have NSF sort of sustain infrastructure. You know, I quote one of the key NSF criteria here that I think just um, makes this tough. And what, what I think is really tough here is the culture. You submit um, proposals to do this sorts of stuff to NSF funding review panels. You don't know what you're going to get. Um, you know, half the panel will just sort of say NSF shouldn't even be funding this, they, you know, they don't even sort of care. Um, it's very difficult here, NSF customers, their budgets tend to be fixed once the award, once their awards are made, uh, which could be 5, 10, 20 years for some of these big research projects. So even if you have something that they absolutely need, uh, they can have a, you know, it becomes a zero sum game for them. Plus, there's always the specter that anytime they're seen spending money on something that isn't the scientific research, right, they're stealing money from scientific research to pay for infrastructure. And, you know, how many dollars spent on cybersecurity um, benefits scientific discovery, right? And we just don't have a good way to prove that calculus 
uh, objectively. We can all argue cybersecurity is needed to secure this infrastructure. On the other hand, everybody spends money on accounting and nobody seems to worry about that taking away from, you know, but it's sort of accepted. Uh, the other thing I've noticed is a lot of their needs here tend to be very rudimentary. Uh, Trusted CI did a number of um, surveys over the years. Florence, I think, was involved with them. Asset inventory was always a top problem. Um, frankly, though, asset inventory has always been a top problem in every organization that I've been part of operational security. And, um, you know, nobody knows what infrastructure they have out there and hence how to secure it. So the result is we have this shaky ground. Um, every PI lives in fear of one bad proposal review cycle undermining their sustainability and projects live in fear of the PI getting, getting undermined and suddenly their, their, uh, their support is gone. So how do we, let's see, uh, I've got a kind of a, everyone read the bottom of this slide. I'm not, my uh, sharing is a little, okay. So here's, here's my vision, and this is admittedly only fractionally baked, but I, I think if NSF really wants to do this, either NSF or the NSF community, the NSRs, they've got to figure out um, a different way to make the decisions. Um, and I do ultimately believe this is a decision-making problem followed by a money flow problem. I think, N I think all the money is there. I think NSF is just really poorly structured to make the other decision-making process um, around sustaining infrastructure. So I think somehow the major research facilities, big CI projects, these other, these other customers in the NSF space have to come together and figure out a membership model where they are entrusting money as part of it, but also trusting a governance structure to sort of say, yes, we need these particular technologies and we're willing to, to support them, incubate them, you know, sort of whatever it takes uh, to get them in the, in the practice. And I actually think the biggest challenge of all that is that governance structure. What, what could be done here such that, that everyone trusts that this would do? And frankly, I'm not quite, I'm not actually convinced it's doable, um, but I actually think that is what it would take to do this. And with that, I will stop sharing and accept all fro all uh, fruits and vegetables thrown at me. Well, thank you both. Um, that was so that was a really intriguing talk. Um, so, Vaughn, is this a so? I guess two questions. One is this a question of just funding large scale, sustainable for you know ten year type resources for research CI? Is it would that solve the issue? Um. I think that it becomes more complicated when it comes to cybersecurity because you know the the NSF funding model sort of assumes some static nature of the world when it comes to these MFRs, and as all we and as we've realized, you know, cybersecurity the landscape changes so quickly, right? I mean, the budget that take one of these major research facilities probably needed for cybersecurity quite reasonably. Uh, in you know the early 90s was was minuscule, right? None of them probably even had a, you couldn't find a line item with a microscope going through their budget. That changed, you know, in 2000, 2010. Now I think they're well behind where they where they sort of should be. And there just isn't an adaptive enough model there. Um, did I did I get your question right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Fred has okay. a question. Yeah. And, and I think that's sort of the big challenge is NSF doesn't have the appropriate way to sort of keep up with something. I mean, it's a basic procurement problem the government has too, right? I mean, they try to procure, you talk to the Navy, right? They want to procure submarines on decades long life cycle and, you know, they can't even keep up with windows, uh, much less cybersecurity. Yeah, Fred. Um, yeah, so... Not so much a question as some comments on, on both of the presenters. Um, so Vaughn, I completely agree with your final conclusion, which is this is a governance problem. And there are a variety of governance solutions that can be applied. One of them is to create a mechanism where you favor NSF funded procurements. So that when NSF is going to procure something for cybersecurity for its own infrastructure, or for the research infrastructure, it has to first buy from anybody, uh, any company or mechanism that was developed through NSF funding, right? So, so that's the kind of thing, it's called eat your own dog food, right? Yeah. The other thing that goes along with that 
<clears throat> is the internal test bed. So you have this infrastructure that's doing all these things. You have so solutions for that, you know, for security for that kind of infrastructure. At a minimum, you should have a digital diode that takes content from that infrastructure, traffic, whatever, and pushes it into an experimental environment. And then you can run all of your technologies in that experimental environment. So it's safe. It's not getting anywhere else. You only import things to it. And you can run all those analysis and detection and so forth. Now, it won't work for influence types of operations, but it'll work for lots of the other stuff. So by leveraging that as part of the research program, you're now giving the researchers <clears throat> sample data, which ha it has to work on in order to be successful in the research. And you're giving, um, you're maturing it to the point where it works on the stuff in your infrastructure. And you now have a demonstration test bed where your infrastructure people can look at it and say, oh, that's actually useful. And then they can transition it. Okay. So that's, and that's uh, not unlike what was done in a DARPA program. Uh, I believe it was called, um, uh, I don't remember, it was for insider um, turning behavior. And so they had real live data from insiders that was coming into the environment, obviously isolated environment. They did all the testing and the technology there, and then that was transitionable into the same places that had fed the data in. So that's a, a path to success. And there's also research involved in building that test environment and so forth. So it's an, a cultural issue, right? Um, and and uh, so, so let me just, so what you want is to create a, a, a culture where the research is gonna do it that way and where the procurements are gonna work that way and where the test bed allows you to demonstrate it on the things you need. And then you need to just dedicate some funds to it and then drive it through the other research programs. For example, that any other research program has to use the security technologies that NSF has determined appropriate for that. And those are all NSF generated security technologies. Right. So if you're doing this kind of research that has this kind of data, you know, then it has to be protected. Suppose it's PII, it has to be protected. And here's some mechanisms that we've provided to protect it. And at a minimum, you have to use these mechanisms. Right. So there's that whole driving it through the rest of the use. <clears throat> that also, of course, creates other adoption. And then for the sustainability of it, you know, what you want to do is fund the things you need. Right. So so your infrastructure has needs. You should get those needs defined by the people that run the infrastructure or, or by an outside party that does a review. And then once you've defined what those needs are, then you fund the things, the security research that also meets those needs. So your procurement process <clears throat> says we need research in this area. And, and in particular, it's going to have to work for our environment, right? You don't necessarily say it that way. but. And then the other thing is for sustainability, you create contract vehicles. So you have some, you know, government contractor that's whose job it is to just sustain those technologies, at least for a few years, because part of the game here is it is going to change. So these things are eternally going to change out and that's fine. You just anticipate it. It's part of the life cycle. It's not a 25 year life, life cycle. It's a three to five year life cycle, which is fine. Right? So those are just my notions that might help on Florence. Um, I, I said this before, I'm going to say it again, you should require the researchers to get help. <laughs> you, you don't have a choice. Your budget includes this much money for this help, right? That's, and, and here's who's going to help you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and just another comment, you said, you know, these little things that, you know, we're going to find these little things that, these aren't the little things. Finding a market for is not a little thing. Finding a fit for the, not a little, those are the big things, right? And just to give you a sense of this, when we do an advisory board for a company, it's like one or two years, right? And, and it, it takes six months just to develop reasonably well all the components of the business plan. And that's at a high pace with a set of advisors helping you in different areas and you dedicating some time towards it. So, so it's not a little thing, it's a big thing, and it's substantial funding. Now, if the funding won't support it directly, 
there are other combinations. You can say, look, so here's a portion of the funding that pays these people, but we're also going to give rights to the resulting work to a company that gets started out of the process. So now you're creating a path to commercialization along the way, and the people that are doing the advice are now also associated with building a company to do that. Right. So, so again, it's, I know it's tricky in the, the way things work, but that, that's sort of the concept you'd like. And, and uh, so th that, those are really the, the main comments. Um, the other one is I wanted to make sure I reflected that I have now discussed funding, but we haven't discussed tenure. So you can do that on your own. So Florence, is there anything that uh, you're learning through? So you're part of this Northeast uh, big data hub and the hubs were ostensibly set up as this kind of, you know, nebulous talk to industry researchers. Is there anything from the hubs that can be leveraged by TTP? The hubs aren't, you know, really helping startups. You know, we work with researchers, we work with students, you know, we give out seed grants to help them further their research. Um, there's no, I think it's what I'm doing with the angel groups that's more interesting to help here. Like what Fred was just saying is give them somebody they have to talk to. It's like being in an angel group, like we're investing in you. Guess what? We get to ask a bunch of questions and we get to give you some advice. So I feel like it's kind of a mix with that. There's nothing in particular at the hub. I mean, we do leverage the hub, as you saw, to let them compete for seed grants or to give them a platform to talk about their research so that maybe we'll find somebody that you know needs it um, to help them teach students about it so that maybe the students will do something with it more longitudinally and they wanna be an entrepreneur. One of the researchers, the TTP researchers I continue to work with, he had two grad students working with him and then one left to do something else. One's still kind of involved. You know, it's a very, very shaky type of environment. Um, so there's nothing in particular um, from the hubs because that really isn't our job. You know, we help enable um, data science innovation, whether it's coming from researchers or students and then teaching students about how to, you know, use data science and, and grow with it. Sure. Um, so that's pretty much um, what I would say. Any, uh, any of the, the folks on the call have some questions? And the other thing I'll just say, Fred, you're so right in, in when I said a little thing like a user, that's how the researchers see it. They're, they're like, I'm trying to solve quantum technology problems, right? And, and you're telling me who's my user? You know, so from their perspective, <clears throat> It is a little thing, but you're right. It is the thing. <laughs> sort of. So look, solving the quantum technology issues, you know, one of the fundamentals of quantum technology, which we've known from the beginning, it's fundamental to quantum technology, is that you're going to have statistical errors. So how do you make a reliable quantum computer out of unreliable components, which is to say quantum components? And, you know, that's what we're already doing with, with other circuits, right? That is, they they have hundreds or thousands of atoms involved in the, every bit, so they have statistical winds, right? And they get hit by, you know, things from outer space and particles and so forth, and that causes bits to fail. So the system as a whole has to be resilient to it and so forth. So, so that part of it for a researcher has to be met. Y yes, you need the fundamental thing to work. And the customer for the fundamental thing is the person who's then going to build something useful out of it. So, you know, great. You know, it, it's the first version takes, you know, a million dollars per qubit, right? <laughs> and, we, and it's just like- At least. <laughs> um, like the genetics, right? So, so this is one of those long-term research, right? Quantum computing is a very long-term sort of effort. Yeah. So you shouldn't be transitioned to practicing fundamental research in almost anything and certainly not in quantum computing at least not yet but it, it depends you know so these are it's a technical discussion but it, it's quantum it, it's zero timer um, technology so it's a, a quantum type of approach it's not like you know a gold quantum computer at ibm or at you know at grumman or something like that so it's quantum techniques and technologies okay so what is in the word quantum to get my funding because it's popular. It's quantum. He's not looking for funding. He's he's very pure of heart. 
He just became uh, chair of his department. He's vice provost. You know, he's happy. But I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, it, we need to add cloud. So it's got to be a cloud-based quantum blockchain. He does use the cloud. He does use the cloud. No, we, we don't say blockchain, though, but I, it's just the same crowd. I, I understand what you're saying, but he's... He is one of those pure academic researchers. He just became, you know, vice provost. That's that's his world. But yeah, then don't do TTP people. with that person. Do real research. NSF yeah. should be doing real research. <laughs> you know? And yeah. TTP is not fundamental research, really. Is it? <clears throat> well, the TTP is added to fundamental research projects, right? There's a TTP extension, so they can do that. So you might consider that, you know, there's what R0 and R1 and R and right. So you might say that R0 doesn't go to TTP. You have to be at least R1 to get to TTP. It might be a, an approach. Just a think, thought. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Cause I think a new a new approach or new approaches, I think could be wise. It could be we have a few ideas here. Um, you know, you're talking about the governance and about, you know, NSF using TTP assets first, I think we're still going to have the TRL problem. And is it really ready? Um, you know, can we mitigate the risk? One thing yeah, well, that's partly done by the test bed, right? When you create the test bed, that's how you mitigate the risk because you're taking the actual content, the actual similar, you know, copy of the infrastructure, verifying it, testing it on there, perfecting it there before you transition it into the live infrastructure. And most of it won't get there. Yep. And that, totally and agree. That's yeah, but yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And so what how many assets are ready, right? And what does ready mean? So the way DHS did it, or I don't know if they're still doing it, but when Paz and Doug were there, they had the TTP researchers working with the end users who needed this thing. And so they had an ongoing test bit where they could TRL it together, so to speak. Yeah, that's the same thing that Rand Waltzman did at DARPA, right? And 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 that and that works really well, right? But but that also means then that those researchers have to be willing to pair with the real environment. And and if they're not, they're not going to get the funding. Yeah. And that, that worked well for them at DHS. It was very specific, but it, it worked well. Um yeah, so steal the good ideas. Trust me, it works. Uh -oh. oh yeah, well actually that's why I'm, when I say in the tip directorate, the people who were do, running that at DHS and Bond knows them too, and so does Alec, they're the ones in tip now. You know, yeah. so they bring that Bond is good at this, right? He's been doing that for a long time. I mean, yeah, the, thing he did before that, the thing he did before that was really interesting. He would fund research in things he already knew worked because they were operating in the classified domain. And he would fund the researchers to do that in the unclassified domain, develop it again from scratch, and then commercialize it. Yeah. <laughs> and they would get occasional hints. Smart guy. Can we invite Chris to jump in? Yes. Um, I was actually <laughs> thinking of uh, sending a, uh, a message to everybody. I will need to go soon. Oh. Uh, I have another engagement, and that is not lunch. Um, but I wanted to thank everybody for the time that you took and your insights. I think that this was very well worth the time that I've spent on these two days. And uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, all the people who were involved in the organization, as well as whoever had the idea to do it in the first place. So. Um, Thank you again. Uh, I hope the recordings are going to be made available. There are some parts that I would like to review. In at least one occasion, my computer crashed. And so I missed uh, uh, some part and then a couple of others I did get distracted. So I would enjoy it if I could have the uh, links of the recordings along with everybody else. So uh, again, thank you very much. I need to go now, but uh, it was a pleasure meeting you all. Likewise, if we can help, thank let us know. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. I've, we appreciate all the feedback. Thank you. And I will get those links out um, as soon as they're done processing. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Bye now. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I'll just echo Chris's thanks um, to Deborah and Alec, nicely organized, and appreciate the invitation.
And, uh, we appreciate you taking us up on that and, and helping us out with, with everything with the workshop. Thank you for having us. Is there anything else you want to discuss before you um, we finish up? Or I could stay a few more minutes. I kind of told everybody I couldn't do anything today. <laughs> I think we just have closing closing remarks. Deborah, did you have anything that you wanted to I, add? I think Chris um, closed it up nicely for us. So if there's anything else y'all want to add, please feel free. Um, otherwise, like I said, I'll get the um, recordings out as soon as I can. And we really appreciate everyone's participation with this. Let me just say one more time how much I appreciate uh, how everybody stepped up. Uh, Deborah stepped up. And uh, for me, when we started this project with Vaughn, I uh, was uh, going out on sabbatical and she saved me and, and uh, has done the lion's share of the work on the, the project itself. And uh, and also had to put up with me during that time. So she's done a great job and I appreciate her. Uh, but uh, for everyone else that stepped up, Anita and Jay is the uh, GA is the uh, chairs of the panels in Florence and, and how much Fred has put into this and Rob joining us and Jeremy. Uh, I, just, I just can't thank you all enough. It's been so good to see everybody. Uh, I wish, uh, you know, my old classmate, I knew we could have got together and had lunch and it was so good to see Angelos who we worked with on these things before. Uh, there will be another workshop uh, off of this uh, project, and I, I would like to ask a favor that if you all would allow us, Deborah and I, to use you as sounding boards on as we organize the upcoming uh, workshop, we'd appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as we move forward, we'll try to stay in touch from our end and, and absolutely will remain a resource to you as you need us. So you've answered when we've called on you. And if we can reciprocate at any time, uh, we stand ready to be uh, your uh, collegial and uh, support you as well. Uh, thank you all very much. I don't have anything else. If there's nothing else, I guess we stand adjourned. Thank you very much. Yeah. Be well. Bye. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Fred.